my pleasure to introduce Lisa Whitaker Brooks. Um, she joins us from the University of Utah. She's an assistant professor of chemistry. She received the 2013 L'Oreal Fellowship for Women in Science Award. Among other recognitions, she was named a Sialog and Cottrell Fellow by the Research Corporation and received the Department of Energy Early Career Award. Her BS degree in analytical chemistry, baby chemistry, is from the University of Panama. I'm a chemist. So, and uh, I lost my place. And under a Fulbright scholarship, she received her MS and PhD degrees in materials chemistry from SUNY Buffalo. So, All right. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. All right, so the cameraman. Tell me if I look better on the, on the left or on the right. <laughs> Just let me know. All right, so I'm going to try to stay as, I'm going to put you to work out here. Okay, so yeah, so I'm, thank you, um, Steve, for the introduction. So before I actually go into my research, I'm at the University of Utah, and um, so I'm part of the recruiting um, committee there. And what I basically did is that I went to the website of every single professor in the department and I made this soup right there, right? And then the part that is the, the, the biggest is the one that we are more, I guess we research the most on. So um, we do a lot of work in DNA, as you can tell. I don't do DNA, but apparently a lot of the people in the department does. Uh, we do a lot of work in catalysis and, um, and trying to come up with new um, catalysts for different type of applications. Um, there's a lot of work going on in enzymes um, as well. So the thing is that it's a very, very diverse um, department in terms of the research portfolio that we offer. Okay. So uh, we have about 172 graduate students in there. Um, about 40 postdocs, 33 faculty members, and we normally place our students in good places in terms of um, getting jobs and faculty positions in there. So actually, Wendy Nimmons, um, she was my first PhD student and she's working for Intel right now, and we have really good facilities in terms of research. Okay, so then the last slide is that if you're looking for a place that resembles Montana in terms of weather, then I encourage you to apply to our graduate program. And for the undergrads, you still have one more year. So if, if you are if you're interested in working and in, in doing some type of summer um, program, then feel free to apply for it. Okay. So, um, what is my research about? So, so I'm a chemist, and we are actually interested in understanding materials at the nanoscale level, and seeing how things that we understand from the microscopic world actually apply to the nanoscale level. And that is a little bit difficult because whenever you start confining materials to um, the nanoscale level, then you start changing the properties according to its size, okay? So in that case, then how will materials, uh, how can you come up with new ways of synthesizing materials for applications at the, um, in the real world? So basically what we try to do here is understand how nanostructures differ, differ from um, bulk materials, one. Um, how do we put these objects together? And how can we make these materials perform multiple functions? But more importantly is that we are dealing with materials that have specific properties at the, um, uh, in very confined sizes, but then we are trying to put it into microscopic devices. So that is the big question that my group is trying to answer. So how do we wire the nano world into the real world, okay? And by doing that, then we think about, well, low cost electronics. And normally when we think about low cost electronics is low cost manufacturing from the manufacturing side of things, not from the customer side, right? So low cost for me to make, but 
higher for you to buy. So that's basically what it is, right? Okay, so before actually going to the topic, we normally make a lot of um, devices and, and materials, but then we link them to devices at the end. So we make materials with a purpose. So the first thing is that we have this project where we make these um, medical cogenite structures and within these medical cogenides, these materials have a lot of defects that you can either, they are intrinsic defects or extrinsic defects that you're trying to modulate. So we actually make a lot of um, field effect transistors here to understand defects, propagations in one dimensional systems, okay? Then um, we always talk about um, low cost electronics. So we actually do a lot of work in organic electronics where we have these pyrrolein diamide molecules that we synthesize in our lab and we again put them into field effect transistors in order to have the counterpart of what is happening in the inorganic world versus the organic world. Um, we also have some transition metal cocogenides that we are actually putting into lithium and sodium batteries and again, understanding defects in these materials and how does that translate into energy storage. Again, these materials have an organic counterpart. So these pyrrolein diamide molecules, again, where you have four sites um, that can bind to lithium. So you can have a four electron um, uh, formation in these materials versus a one electron going in or out of a battery. So in this case, you will have four ch charge being transferred into your system versus a one electron transfer that you normally have in an inorganic material. Okay, so then we do a lot of work with um, polymeric systems and mostly in um, thermoelectrics. So what happened with these materials is that now their electrical conductivity is extremely high and now that you have these um, conducting polymers in there and they are all made of carbon and oxygen then the thermal conductivity tends to be low. So for thermoelectric purposes you want a material that conducts electrons very well but does not conduct heat that well. Okay so um, that's why these organic materials are, those, are, are so um, useful. Then um, whenever we think about confining materials or shrinking the sizes of materials, then we find a challenge, and that challenge is that we are not dealing with electrons anymore, or we are not taking it to the, 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 the properties of an electron is not, um, is not an advantage anymore because we are confined by size. So what happened now is that you can start thinking about another property of an electron that is a spin. So that in that case then, we can take these same materials that are good for thermoelectrics and use them as spintronic devices. And where you're just looking at the rotation of your spin, either your spin being up or down with its precession. So again, we do a lot of work on that. Um, then we have, these self-dope molecules in which we try to tether dopants to organic molecules in order to increase their electrical properties. Again, for thermoelectric and spintronic applications. Okay, then I actually ended up having this project with um, two undergrads that wanted to make solar cells, and it turned out pretty well. So we are making these materials again, granted that we are trying to control defects so we have these PN heterojunctions that actually came up from the fact that we cannot control defects in these materials. So what happened in this system is that we actually started with tin sulfide and we were interested in making these vertically oriented tin sulfide nanowires. The problem is that whenever we process these tin sulfide nanowires, they're not pure tin sulfide. So by the virtue of the synthesis, we end up having a mixture of tin sulfide and tin disulfide, which is actually pretty good. It's like in, in a good way. And why is that? Because tin sulfide is actually a P-type semiconductor and tin disulfide is an N-type semiconductor. 
So within the same wire, then you have a junction. So it means that if you apply light, then you can just make a solar cell within that hetero junction. So it turned out to be pretty good, the fact that we cannot control defects in these systems. So we actually make solar cells out of that. And with these pearlin diamide, we also have these dimers that we are making also as electron acceptors for um, organic solar cells. So then what I'm going to be talking today about actually is um, these inorganic organic hybrid perovskite systems that we are also incorporated into solar cells and into other functional devices such as um, IR photodiodes. Okay, so before we actually go into perovskites, why do we care about this, right? So that is our little world and we consume about 16 terawatts of um, energy per year, right? Um, but then it's estimated that we will need about 30 terawatts of energy by 2050. So where do we actually get energy from? So this is our renewable, um, non-renewable sources. And if we actually do the math, we also, we, are, we have about 50 to 96 years left of renewable energy. Okay, so I can think that I will be all right. Most of us in this room will be all right because we're not going to be around here. Okay, but probably if you're thinking of having kids or my two-year-old son might be in trouble. Okay, so we have to think about other um, alternatives um, to mitigate the fact that we are running out of our reserves. And the way that we can think about that is putting into perspective of different uh, renewable sources that are available there. So you can think about wind, biomass, water, um, whatever it is. And that will give you a certain amount of energy that you can use in order to power the planet. Okay? But if you actually think about the sun, the sun gives you about 23,000 terawatts of energy per hour. Okay, so it's way more than what we actually need. Okay, however, that process is not that efficient. But still, if we actually use 15% of that, that is way more than what we will actually need by 2050. Okay, okay, so now what's the problem? So I'm from Panama, I don't know anything about the US, and I actually Google. I just wanted a map, and this is the map that came out. And I'm like, okay, so the United States of Awesome. And if we are thinking about solar cells, right, and you say, well, um, I go to the sunniest state in the U.S. according to the United States of Awesome map, it will be Arizona, right? So we actually cover Arizona in 15% um, efficient solar cells. So 650 um, square kilometers, sorry for the international unit, instead of using miles. So if you actually cover Arizona with that amount of solar cells, that will do the work, okay? The thing now is the cost. So at $350 um, per meter square, then the U.S. cannot go to any war for a long time. Okay, that is the downside, but actually the, the thing about the United States of Awesome map that you can actually go to the United States of Shame. And in this map, actually, if we focus on Arizona at, again, so we actually cover Arizona with that same amount of solar cells and we help mitigate alcoholism in Arizona. So we're actually doing something good by working with solar cells, okay? All right, so that is enough with the perspective. So now let's go into um, what organic and organic hyperperovskites are. So actually, if you think about our organic and organic system, um, traditionally you will say, well, you have an inorganic nanowire uh, or, or an inorganic component in there, and then you will coat that material with an organic system. So for the last 
20 years, that was the um, definition of a hybrid system in terms of um, organic, uh, organic and organic semiconductors. Then in 2009, there was a lot of uh, focus on this material where you can actually think of it of a true organic and organic hybrid material. So there is just one material that is actually composed of an uh, inorganic cage, which is this PBI6, 4 minus, so it's a uh, PBI6 um, octahedra that is surrounded by an organic cation. And this organic cation is this CH3, NH3 that is there, so it's a methyl ammonium cation. And this system actually has a lot of tunable properties, and these tunable properties come from the fact that you can swap either the lead component for another um, metal in there, or you can change the organic cation and put another organic cation of your choice. And those two different iterations will change the electronic properties of your system. Another thing is that these materials are very defect tolerant. So you will not end up making a lot of um, grain boundaries. So whenever it crystallizes, it crystallizes into these big crystals. Okay? All right. Everything that is good is also bad. And the issue with this material now is that you have a lot of stability issues. There's a lot of problems with device irreproducibility um, due to the nature of this material being um, ionic. So you will have ions moving to your collecting electrodes a lot. Um, and then you have the um, interaction of the transport layer and the perovskite layer is not well understood in the device. So what do I mean by that? So how does a solar cell work? So we have light, of course. And then we have uh, an electron that is being excited from the valence band through your band gap right here. So that electron is excited from your conduction band. And then from the conduction band, that electron will travel to your electrode, in this case your cathode. Then you will have a hole that is left behind in your valence band and is going to be collected in your anode. The issue now is that this process is not very effective in the fact that you can have electrons that want to go the other way and holes that want to go the other way, okay? And they will meet and they will recombine. So what you, do, you, what you uh, end up doing here is that you put chaperone layers that help you guide charges. And those are basically called transported, um, transport layers. So for example, if you want your electron to go to the cathode, then you will put an electron transport layer there. And then if you want your hole to go to the anode, then you will put a hole transport layer there. But also, those layers will also work as um, blocking layers. So if you don't want a hole to go, you don't want an electron to go to the anode, then the hole transport layer will actually work as an electron blocking layer. So it will block that charge from going there. The same thing will happen with the electron transport layer. So it will be a whole blocking layer. And this actually depends on the energy alignment of all these systems, which I'm going to um, talk about um, later. What's the problem now? So um, if you listen to rap music, and have you ever heard a rap that says more money, more problems? So the same thing happened here. So if you have more interfaces, more problems. So here you're bringing two different interface, interfaces that actually help modulate or, or, or is a challenge in terms of how do you make these charges travel more effectively through those interfaces. So we actually try to understand what happened at the interface of these systems. So the one that I'm going to focus today is the electron transport layer interface in terms of what happened in terms of morphology, in terms of energy level alignment, um, in terms of charge transfer mechanism, and in terms of the solar cell efficiency um, as the ultimate goal. OK, so we say that we are just looking at the electron transport layer. So what are we asking the electron transport layer to do for us? So one, we want the electron transport layer to be transparent um, 
in the visible, so we don't want it to be absorbing light. We just want it to transport charges. That's it. We want it to have a high electromobility, meaning that the charges are transferred more effectively. Uh, we want it to be um, stable chemically and physically. And we also want it to be compatible with the active layer. OK, so what are the potential materials out there? So we have zinc oxide and thin oxide that are good. And they have really good mobilities, but they interact with the perovskite layer, and it degrades it. Because these layers are actually hydroscopic. And perovskites do not like water. So they will just degrade. So the only one that is left behind is actually titanium dioxide. So the mobility here is not as high as zinc oxide and tin oxide, but it works and is actually compatible with the perovskite layer. So we're kind of stuck with this one. All right, so what we wanted to know now is what will happen with the morphology of that layer, the amount of defects in that layer, and how does that impact the perovskite layer, so my active layer in my solar cell. So we came up with three different ways of making this system. So one is a bulk fabrication that we just dip coat the film. And we make these um, planner um, films. So I'm going to abbreviate that as bulk TiO2. So we actually have the same solution. And we put in a, a, a surfactant in there. And we calcine the surfactant. In this case, is this pluronic one, two, three. Then we can make a mesoscopic or a mesoporous um, TiO2 layer. The same time, then we also investigated the, the, form, the formation of TiO, TiO2 by doing just a basic sputtering technique. So we sputter that layer. Okay? So you basically start with a target, and then that target you eject um, particles from that into the formation of that film. So those are the three different layers that we are using as the electron transport layer. OK, so in terms of um, crystal structure and morphology, so if we actually look at the mesos, mesoporous uh, TiO2 layer, well, I'm actually going to call that as TiOx because it doesn't have an amorphous, it's, it's, it's an amorphous structure. It doesn't have a crystalline um, structure. As we saw here in the XRD, that doesn't see, it doesn't show any um, diffraction peaks. Then when we go to the bulk and the crystalline layers, the bulk TiO2 layers, so the sputter one and the one that we did by solution um, synthesis, then we see that the evolution of some peaks there, which means that this is the crystalline component of that. Now, um, we are actually interested in the anatase phase. So we actually um, calcine the film until we form the anatase phase. So TiO2 has two different, has two prevalent phases. So it has a rutile phase and an anatase phase. The rutile phase is insulated. The anatase phase is a semiconductor, and it also has a third um, layer that is called brookite, but that one is just a layer, like important for geologists. OK, so, so we know which one are, um, are crystalline, which one is amorphous. Then if we actually look at the um, morphology of these films, so in the mesoporous, we have the formation of these little holes within the film. And that is basically the mesoporous part. And then for the bulk and the sputter, it's more of a continuous film. So then you will see here that we have the roughness mean square. So the mesoporous give us uh, a 1.4 nanometers. It's 1.4 nanometers rough. So the lower the the lower that number, then the more smooth it is. Okay. So you got 2.3 for the bulk, and then the sputter is 0 0.9, 0 0.5 nanometers, which means it's the uh, smoothest smoothest from the three of them. Okay. So we know what it looks in terms of morphology. What happens in terms of defects? So we can actually use the emission signal if we do photoluminescence to quantify the number of defects that we have in this system. So for the um, mesoporous one, we see a very gigantic peak um, around 
the um, around 300 to um, 600 nanometers. And this peak is mostly related to defect um, evolution in the film. And these <coughs> defects come from oxygen vacancies that are present in that TiO2 uh, film. Then when we go to bulk, then the defect concentration actually go down. And then with the sputter, it goes down even lower to the point where we cannot pick it up from PL. But if you have, if you have ever taken a solid state class or any class in terms of defects, you will never have a material that is defect free unless that you are zero Kelvin, okay? So the thing is that those defects are there. So this is a very qualitative way of saying, well, the concentration of defect go down as you go from a mesoporous layer to a um, solution-based bulk layer to a spotter layer. So we um, did quantitative measurements in order to determine the defect concentration by doing capacitance measurements. So what I want you to focus here is actually in whatever it, it says N so the trap density, so and delta N O T is directly proportional to your um, depletion width. So from that, then you can just characterize the width of your capacitance measurements and determine your concentration. So if you go from mesoporous here, so that is the depletion width is pretty broad. Then when you go to the uh, bulk, then it start becoming um, narrower. And then when you go to the spotter, it's mostly, it's very um, tight. So then if we calculate the defect concentration, it goes to 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 12 in the uh, spotter system. So we have less defects in there, okay? Which also correlate to what we were seeing in, in terms of the trend with the emission data. Okay, so we know um, what is happening just with the pure electron transport layer. So now the issue comes when you start putting the perovskite layer on top, All right? So we spin coated that perovskite layer on the top and we took a couple of SEM images here to just see how the morphology is changing. So if you look just at the pictures at the bottom, then you will say, well, um, there's not much change in the morphology, right? Which is quite true, but as chemists, we don't like that answer, and we like something that's a little bit more definite and more prettier. So what we do is that we, we do a lot of um, synchrotron experiments, and this is um, called Grayson Incident X-ray dis Diffraction. And what we're actually doing is just collecting all the diffraction that come from a P, uh, of a sample at a Grayson angle. So if you have a film, then you can get inform structural information from a material out of plane, um, that is aligned out of plane versus in plane. So you will get this um, image that is a two-dimensional image where you will have your QXY in the plane of the graph and then your QZ is gonna be out of plane. So if you actually get a ring, then that is telling you that your sample is not oriented at all. So that is what this um, isotropic um, um, image means. Then if you get a semi-ring or a spot that is out of plane, then it means that your materials actually align parallel to the substrate. And if you have a couple of rings that is um, in, in, in the, in, um, close to the QXY direction, then it means that your material is actually oriented face, um, um, is oriented edge on with respect to the substrate. Why is this important? So if we actually think about solar cells, right? you normally do not make a solar cell where your material is aligned perpendicular to your substrate. So you normally align this material like this, like sandwiches. So you want to characterize your material in order to know in what direction your active layer is being oriented. So if you have a material that is being oriented 
um, perpendicular to the substrate is not that good for solar cells because the sun doesn't come from the side, right? So, so that is the that is the why of why you want to do these type of characterizations. So it actually started out in organic electronics where you can have these um, organic molecules aligned in different ways. And in organic electronics, you all rely on pi-pi interaction. So if your pi-pi interaction is out of plane, then you will want that for a photovoltaic device. If your pi-pi interaction is aligned in the plane of the substrate, or parallel to the substrate, then you want to use this for transistors because your electrodes are actually um, in the plane of the um, substrate. Okay, so then we did GIXD on these um, samples and then look at the characterization of those peaks. So the brighter it is in yellow, it means that it's more intense in that direction. So this is what was reported in the literature before. So you have A there. And if you actually remember, I told you that if you have a complete ring, then it means that that layer is not oriented. OK? So what people have been publishing before have shown that these layers are not that oriented. So if you actually control the orientation of these films, then your efficiency should be higher. Then again, we are chemists, so we like to quantify stuff in a lot of ways. So we can quantify the degree of orientation of these films by a function that is called a Hermann's orientation function. And what this is basically saying is that if you have, if you, assim um, if you asymmetrically integrate the intensity of all these peaks from your Q, from let's say zero to zero in terms of Q, X, Y, then you and, and if you get those numbers, and it can either be one or zero. So if you have a, a Hermann's orientation function of one, then it means that your sample is aligned normal to the substrate. Then if you have a Hermann's orientation function of zero, then the sample is not oriented. So if you actually do that for our samples, then we get a Hermann's orientation function of 0.7. So it means that some of the crystals are actually oriented at 20 degrees with respect to the substrate. So we don't have completely um, stacked crystals, but we have some crystals that are actually oriented like so. OK, so, so in that case, if about 70% of the crystals are oriented out of plane, then we will say that this will be a decent material for solar cells. Okay. So we talk about morphology. We know the structure. We know the morphology with the, um, the different interfaces when you put in the perovskite in there. What happened in terms of energy level alignment, right? So in terms of energy level, what we're looking for. So we are looking for uh, the compatibility between the different levels for transfer to take place. So electrons like to, so the analogy that I like to use here is a stair. So electrons like to go down the stairs. Holes like to go up the stairs, okay? So if your barrier for your electrons is for them to go up the stairs, that's not gonna happen, okay? If your barrier for your holes to, is to, for them to go down the stairs, that's not gonna happen, okay? So what we're doing here is actually quantifying the position of the valence band and the conduction band for all those different layers and making sure that they match. So I'm not going to go into the detail of all the different techniques and experiments that we, go, that we did in order to get this data. So you will have to just trust me. So this is the result. So we did um, ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy and absorption spectroscopy to get the energy level alignments. So for the first system, so we have both TiU2 there. So we get the uh, position of the valence band and the conduction band. Since we are looking at the electron transport layer, so we will have, we will want the transition to be from the conduction band of the perovskite layer into the conduction band of the um, electron transport layer. So we can actually quantify that and get the difference. So you want that difference to be as small as possible. 
Okay, so that gives you a difference about 0.02 EVs. Then we can do the same thing with the sputter TiO2 layer. Um, so that difference is about 0.01. Then when we go to the mesoporous layer, again, if you remember, I told you that electrons don't like to go down the stairs. And this barrier, so my laser is not working, and I actually need to show you this. So the barrier, if I have electrons that are here, then the barrier means that my electrons have to go up the stairs, right? So this right here is actually not um, allowed or is not that efficient. So in terms of making solar cells now, and well, and the difference is about 0.3 EV. So in terms of making solar cells now, um, it's very easy to predict which one would be the least efficient one, all right? So the one that will have the biggest barrier. So we know that. So now we say, well, now that we know what is happening in terms of defects, morphology, energy level alignment, what if we actually make a device? So now we have all these layers. Um, so we make these devices here, all right? So this is all the stack that we are using for the, uh, the solar cell itself. So what are we quantifying here? So we are quantifying efficiency. So this is how the graph will normally look like. And what we're doing here is quantifying a parameter that is called the open circuit voltage. And the open circuit voltage is the voltage that I will, ha well, actually I'm talking about the short circuit current. The short circuit current will be the point where my voltage is equal to zero, okay? Then I will have then my open circuit voltage, and my open circuit voltage will be the position where my um, current is equal to zero. Then I have my field factor. So my field factor is how well my interfaces like each other, All right? So it's like a marriage and having a marriage counselor. So that's basically what the field factor is. Okay. So in that case, then, we can think about what a solar cell basically is. So it's a circuit. And what you want is charges to flow through that circuit in the most effective way. So you will have two different resistances in there. So you will have a series resistance. So if you want charges to go to, to flow in this direction, then you want your series resistant to be as low as possible. This is another path. So if it goes through this path, it's not gonna conduct any, it's not gonna uh, conduct any electricity or it's not gonna form any electricity. So you want this shunt resistant or parallel, parallel resistant to be as high as possible. So you can just block that um, route, okay? So then when you compute your, VO, your JSC, so JSC is just the current that you are forming, your VOC is your band gap, basically, all right? So it's the voltage that you will have in your band gap. So for a perovskite layer, you're talking about 1.6 um, volts that you can theoretically produce. So that is what your VOC is. So if you do not reach that VOC point, then it means that you have inter interfacial losses. And then you have your fill factor, and it means, again, the level of how much those interfaces like each other. So when you have those three parameters at one sun, so it means that 100 milliwatts per um, square centimeters of sun power, then you will get your efficiency. Okay, so how does this thing look like? So for the three different layers, we have two different uh, plots in there. So one is a reverse and the other one is a forward. So reverse is, so the forward, you go from um, negative voltage to positive voltage. And then since you have ion migration in there, then it's like having a battery. So you're building uh, a bunch of charges close to the electrode. And then when you run it the other direction, then it releases back and you increase the efficiency. If I have to say something about this in the field, it's like sheeting. And for the longest, this was the problem because of ion migration that was not reported. So the higher efficiencies were actually getting in the reverse 
side instead of the scientists were not telling people that that was the case. Anyways, so if we actually go to the sputter system, then we get an efficiency of about 30%, fill factor is 64, so it means that those interfaces really like each other. Now, if you actually remember from the um, graph that, we, that I showed you before, the mesoporous one should have not even worked, right? Because there is a barrier there, and you get an efficiency of about 7%. Not as high as the sputter, but um, better than the bulk TiO2. So why is that? So with the mesoporous layer, um, you have more infiltration of the perovskite that is in better contact with TiO2. So now you have a gain in surface area. And that's why you will see that the devices actually work instead of just being um, energetically um, blocked. Okay. So now we can quantify recombination in these systems. So whenever we have charges coming together, we have um, um, a, a free carrier. So we have an electron and a hole. That electron and a hole can just come again together and recombine. Or there could be a defect within the system where, let's say, a hole um, gets stuck in that trap and then um, uh, uh, an electron gets stop, stuck in that trap, and then a hole is dumb enough to get stuck in that trap too. So that is what is called a trap, uh, uh, trap assisted recombination. So then we can quantify those two. We saw that the bimolecular recombination effect is pretty low. So it means that the probability of an electron and a hole finding itself is very low. But if there is a trap, the probability of that electron finding a hole and recombining at the trap is very high. So there is a lot of traps or defects left in this material, even though that they are very low in defect concentration. Okay, so we can again um, explain that in terms of we have the absorption of a charge. We can have momentarily the formation of an exciton. We have... Um, we can have the hole and electron um, split, or they can come together again and form a, something that's called geminate recombination. So geminate recombination is good for light emitting diodes. So that's basically how a, diode, a light emitting diode works, an LED. And then that exciton will just um, form free charges, and you can have bimolecular recombination, which is weak, and then the trap assisted recombination, which is high. Then um, if you actually do time resolve PL, then you can tell how quick those charges recombine at the trap sites, okay? So then in that case, we get the lowest, um, the lowest for the uh, mesoporous, which means that there are more chances of that recombining in the mesoporous layer than the bulk, and then the sputter is the longest in terms of time. Okay. So, and what I can conclude from that is that you have defects um, that are actually more powerful in these interfaces that you will normally have in um, other materials. So normally people tend to forget about the defects uh, at the interface of these systems, which is extremely important. And normally they will just focus on the morphologies. Okay? All right. So. What I'm gonna do in pretty quick is just talk about something else that we're doing here and is mostly changing the, the, the orientation of these materials. So you can talk about how do you change the orientation, how do you increase the stability of these systems. And the problem with perovskite layers is that it will decompose into lead iodide, that yellow film, pretty, pretty rapidly, okay? Particularly in the presence of moisture. So how can you block that? So we actually ended up making these 3D perovskites with two different morphologies. So one is the morphology that is normally um, uh, reported in the literature. So it's this 110 orientation where you have the um, perovskite layer um, auto plane. And then you can also have something that we call orientation two. So in the orientation two, then you have the, the lead being 
the face that is exposed. So that is your orientation tool there. So in your orientation tool, then you have more of the perovskite layer in, 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 in a hydrophobic orientation, or, or the hydrophobic portion of the film is the one that is being exposed. Okay, so then we did a bunch of characterizations here. We look at the electronic properties of the two different layers. Um, story short is that there was not a lot of changes going on. And I was like, okay, so I don't know what to do. I know that we can tune the morphology, but how is that useful? So what is happening? So we made devices and the device efficiency were 2% different. So 2% is relatively good in terms of increasing efficiency. But then why, why is that happening, right? And again, I didn't know what was going on because in terms of energy level, morphology, they are the same. So then we thought about surface energetics. We're like, well, can we just take these different orientations and then just quantify the surface energetics and then see what is happening? So if we actually look at the water contact angle for orientation one, then this is about 106.1 Eric per um, um, square centimeters, which means that this film is actually very hydrophilic. Then if we look at orientation two, then the surface energetic here is 40.7. So the surface is extremely hydrophobic, okay? So the thing is then what happened when you put the top layer, so in this case you have your whole transport layer in your perovskite, and that whole transport layer is actually processed in a nonpolar solvent. So if you have a hydrophobic surface in contact with that layer, then you are increasing the interaction or a better interaction between those two. So now you, we have a good control of the electron transport layer and we know what is happening in terms of the whole transport layer. And that's why that efficiency is increasing. Okay, so now we know what is happening in terms of those perovskite layers, but now can we actually use perovskite layers for something else that is not solar cells, right? And, and if you, and, and I have to be careful with what I say in this statement because I, I think I'm one of the person that get extremely angry with what is happening with perovskites right now. I think it has been put in every type of application, including cancer. Um, so people just think that you can just like use it for everything that you can think of, right? So can we actually start thinking more into the properties of these materials and then saying, well, yeah, we can use it because of these fundament because we have a fundamental understanding of the electro electronic properties of this system. So in order to do that, then we either swap tin and then we see that the tin two will oxidize to tin four and it actually turns into a very good metallic system that is not good for solar cells and we have proven that it's good for thermoelectrics because you actually need a highly uh, electrical conductor system. And then you have the organic component in there that makes the thermal conductivity low. Then at the same time, if you have these two dimensional layers where the spacer are these very fatty acid looking um, um, uh, layers, then you increase the exciton binding energy of these systems. So your exciton is a tightly bound electron and hole. So for solar cells, you want your electron and hole to split. So if the binding energy is high, they are not gonna split, all right? But then the other process is that you can have that electron and hole come together and that is your light emitting that and emit light. So that is your light emitting diode. So you can actually have these systems be used for LEDs instead of solar cells. So it's not a generic thing that you can take any perovskite and incorporate it or dump it into solar cells, okay? So in that case, you can have LEDs with these systems and then you can tune the color depending on what cation you put there or what spacer you put in there. Okay, so then I'm just gonna talk about 2D for a couple of minutes before I wrap up. 
But then you have these 2D perovskite layers, and what happened is that you actually end up making something that is called a quantum well. And a quantum well is just a material that has mismatch in terms of the dielectric constant. So you have a high dielectric constant with an organic material and a low dielectric constant with an inorganic material. And then you can control the sizes of the well as much as you can control the sizes of the barrier. And by doing that, then your exciton binding energies in these quantum wells tend to be extremely high. So now, what happened in terms of um, um, structural properties and electronic properties? So structural properties, we can use NEXA spectroscopy to quantify that. So basically what we're looking here is the um, uh, uh, source of light will come in, excite an electron from your valence band into an uh, uh, empty orbital in your conduction band. And from there, then you will emit either an Rg electron or you can have the formation of a fluorescence electron or a fluorescence photon. Then from there, your RG electron will give you information of whatever is happening in the surface. Then you can just use your fluorescence signal to get information from your bulk. So if you have something that is changing throughout the um, thickness of your sample, then you can actually quantify all the different heterogeneities within your sample. Okay, so we did um, next half on these systems, and what I'm showing you here is going from a 3D system to 2D systems in terms of the carbon edge. So the carbon K edge will be the transition of an electron from a 1s to who knows where. Normally it's 1s to a p orbital, wherever it is, because by um, dipole selection rules you can just go from an s, L equal, L equal plus minus 1. So you can go s to p or p to d or go down. So you cannot do s to d, for example. Okay, so in that case, then we can calculate that correct ratio. So if you calculated that correct ratio, then you're, if you're plus minus one, it's highly oriented. Zero means that it's randomly oriented. So we go from 3D, means that the cation in the 3D system, so the methyl ammonium lead iodide is not oriented. Then you go to butyl ammonium lead iodide, then you get a that correct ratio of 0.2. Then if you go to phenyl ethyl um, lead, lead iodide, then ethyl um, ammonium iodide, then lead iodide, then you get 0.55. So as you start increasing the size of that cation, then you order that organic cation, okay? So, and that is a little bit in stark contrast to what is happening in terms of the structure. So the structure can be oriented, but it doesn't mean that the cation is oriented, okay? So the 3D, you have an oriented structure, but the cation is freely, um, uh, it can freely rotate. In the 2D, you have a very uh, um, hi a, a highly oriented structure, and the cation is actually oriented as well. Okay? So then we can think about the electronic properties of these systems so we can structurally characterize them. We did um, temperature dependent PL, and we see changes in the formation of a new phase that comes into play. So whenever you decrease the temperature, then you see a new phase um, coming in. <coughs> and again, we are interested in fundamental properties of these materials, so we can actually do something that is called electroabsorption. And in electroabsorption, what we're doing <coughs> is looking at how excitons and um, charges close to the band edge um, respond to an electric field. So they will change depending on the electric field that you are um, applying. So in this case, you will have a start shift. So it's just a shift if of your excitons. Or you can have um, Franz Kildish oscillations that are just related to whatever is happening in your band edge. So if you take the derivative of that, then you will have this oscillation right there that you can quantify. So. Um, here is the electroabsorption at 50K. So we did the um, derivative, the first derivative of that, and then you see these different oscillations. So one and two are actually due to excitons. Then you have three, that is the um, convolution of uh, the band gap of the low temperature phase and the room temperature phase at 50K. 
So what has happened is that whenever you decrease the temperature, you still have a mix of the room temperature phase at low temperature. So it has a memory effect. It really likes to be at low temperature. So you never get rid of the room temperature when you decrease the temperature. Then F4, so that small peak right there, is what would be the um, FK oscillations close to the band edge. So then you can think about that in terms of um, applying a, an, an electric field. So you can change the electric field and then fit that depending on the changes that you will see in the strength of the electric field um, based on two different formulas. So if you do a F square, F square dependence, then you will have exciton broadening, meaning that this is actually due to an exciton and not to the band gap transition, right? Then if you quantify it according to a F one third, then that, if it follows a straight line, then that has to be due to the band gap transition and not to the exciton. So you can basically deconvolute what is happening in the, um, in the band gap versus the formation of an exciton. And why this is so important is because whenever you are applying, you require energy, right? So the sun. So if you're exciting something above or below the band gap, then you might not split the exciton effectively. So you actually want to know what energy you need to use in terms of correlating that to power in order to know what should be the right energy in order to excite that exciton or to split that exciton at the right energy um, spot, okay? <coughs> All right, so then from there, then we can quantify the two different states and say, well, if I want to excite an exciton from whatever is happening in the 1S into the band gap, then I need to apply 190 mil electron volts for the outer phase, then it has to be 220, okay? So that's basically what it is. So I think I run out of time. And, oh, my computer's not there. I'm gonna jump to the end. So in, in terms of conclusions, so we normally try to think about this as an interfacial problem, right? And, and the problem with um, thinking about material science or technologies is that, um, it can be time related in, in the sense that solar cells are relevant today, but probably in 50 years it won't. Like we will get some other way of harvesting energy or, right? So, but the thing is that the different interfaces that you have in solar cells and understanding interfaces in solar cells are very much applicable to any, every other devices that we use nowadays. Okay, so you can actually start with solar cells, and then if you understand those interfaces, then you can think of interfaces in spintronics, you can think of interfaces in thermoelectrics, you can think of interfaces in batteries, you can think of interfaces in LEDs. Okay, so it's an interfacial issue. All right, so with that, I'm just gonna thank my group, they are the one that do all the, the work and the funding, and with that. I'm open for questions. Uh, the assisted recombination at each defect site, mm -hmm. is it unlimited or once it's occupied, then you don't, you don't keep assisting recombination? Once it's occupied, it's done, okay. right? So, um, yeah, so basically you will have to apply a energy to break the formation of that exciton in that trap. Yeah. But there's enough of them that it still makes a big difference. Yeah, so, so that's the thing, like, um, so, and, and, and to be honest with you, the probabilities of finding a trap, well, in perovskites is extremely low compared to other inorganic semiconductors, which is nice, but it still happened. You still have those traps in there. 
compared to in, in comparison to silicon, for example. And and that's why silicon is so expensive because there are so much traps in silicon that you can't afford them. So you have to make very high quality silicon in order to remove all those trap sites. You can't get that kind of perfection with titanium oxide? Well, ti what? no. Mm -mm. Yeah. Do you see, <coughs> excuse me, do you see a difference in the number of deep trap seeds versus shallow trap seeds when you start doing the sputter coating versus the mesa pores? Yes. We do. So, um, so with the, so it actually correlates to the, the number of defects. So the number that I'm showing you here is actually the, the concentration of all defects that you will find. Surface, bulk, deep, shallow, right? But if you actually look at the ultraviolet for electron spectroscopy data a little bit more carefully, then you can deconvolute your deep state versus your shallow states. And you get more deep states where you move more toward the mesoporous than what you will get with the um, sputter. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the mesoporous titanium oxide, the fact that it doesn't, uh, that the band gap is such that it doesn't favor Mm -hmm. Can it be used? Could you use it in combination with the other forms such that you know when you have the current going through it flows normally and then on the other? I'm just asking if it can be used in combination to make it complete full cycle. If you go back to uh, one of the so. So let's say that you really like, um, so let's say that you really, really, really like that TiO2 because you really like it, right? Um, instead of just tossing that, where is it? instead of just tossing that layer, right? Yeah. Oops. So what you could potentially do here is, well, two things. So one, you can potentially use, well, you can potentially modulate this layer to bring this even up. The problem now is that there is something that actually didn't make a lot of emphasis here, is that this is close to vacuum. So you want to be far away from vacuum as you can, because what happens is that um, the oxidation potential for all these systems will be higher if you are at higher vacuum levels. So they are not that stable, okay? So, so if you actually want to use this, you could potentially change the conduction band of your perovskite layer. So how do you, how will you actually do that now, right? So what you can do is actually end up your perovskite layer. So you can change your conduction band. But in combination with the other ones? No. If for some reason this was, the data will have gone the other way and say like, okay, so this is actually going down, but way down, then you can say, well, I could use this instead of an electron transport layer as a whole blocking layer, right? And there are cases where you can, you can do that. Like if you're coming up with new materials and then you calculate the energy alignment, then you say, well, this material is actually not good as an as a electron transfer layer. It's good as a whole blocking layer. And that's how people come up with new electron transfer layers <coughs> for solar cells, for example. Are you guys moving towards nickel oxide? Is that an early slide I saw with the nickel oxide? So we have a couple of papers that we deal with nickel oxide. Um, but nickel oxide now is not an electric transport layer, it's a whole blocking layer, uh, a whole transport layer. So it means that it's the other way around. So in this case, charges, so you have your, your charges, your, your hole actually going down instead of your electron going down. So it's an inverse device. So instead of having, 
So instead of having uh, a, actually not that graph, yeah. So instead of having a graph look like so, you're going to have a graph look like this. So it's the other way around, right? And there's advantage of doing that that I don't think I'm going to answer here. Unless you don't want to go home. <laughs> I was going to say if there's one more question, but 